Today I want to show you one proven method to capture those big sucker species that are known to be tricky to get on rod and reel, those black and smallmouth buffalo suckers, two of the top three largest suckers in the world. We'll go over how to tie the rig, the simple baits to use, and even go over why identification within this genus of suckers is so tricky. Everyone, Cole here of KNFS, where we fishers are always learning and sharing knowledge about fishing and fishes. So let's first just go over the basic places to find this uh, genus, these suckers. The three species of ichthyobus suckers that we have in the United States are big mouth, small mouth, and black buffaloes. And of course, they have overlapping ranges. But you're typically going to find these species of robust bodied suckers in big bodies of water. We're talking rivers and lakes, often in the calm areas or in the silty backwaters. Though black buffalo can tolerate faster currents more than the other buffalo suckers. Black and smallmouth buffaloes are primarily benthic feeders or bottom feeders, as we can see by the positioning of their mouths, usually feeding on macroinvertebrates like larval insects and mollusks. That's why the rig we're tying today sits on the bottom. So this method I'm going to show you today was sort of stumbled upon accidentally as I was modifying a rig that I normally use for carp fishing. So one day I was set up along the Kankakee River in northern Illinois and a big shoal of some fish just kept taking the boilies off my hair rigs and I wasn't getting hook sets. I figured it wasn't big carp because I'd never experienced such high failure rate of hook sets before. So I started thinking maybe it was just really small carp or even suckers. So after getting all of these hits and non hook sets on my size 2 and 4 G carp specialists, I retied on a smaller size. 10 G Carp Specialist RX using a longer hair rig and instead of using any fancy stuff on my rig I just put sweet corn on it with a boiling mixture on the method bed. Within minutes I had a big buffalo on the rig then soon after I was landing more and on every subsequent fishing expedition to the river during the rest of the summer this technique didn't fail to produce big buffaloes. I expect the original failure rate was happening with those big hooks because Suckers just have such sensitive lips. I mean, just look at those papillae. That is sensory organ central right there. A smaller hook was likely needed to evade detection by those lips. So if you are going for these big suckers, I'd recommend a small hook, but not a light wire. It's gotta be something that is thick and strong to support that power of a big sucker like this. So let me just quickly show you how I tie this rig. I use at least 50 pound braided line for both the main line and the leader, a 65 pound braided barrel swivel, a Gamakatsu G Carp Specialist RX number 10 as the hook and a method lead. I'll cut about a foot of line and that'll end up being a real short leader after tying everything. With the tag end, fold the line over itself and make two overhand knots to create two built in bait stops for the hair rig, one near the end and one that'll be closer to the shank. You can even add more if you want. This tag end of the hair rig will be really long compared to the shank. Thread the standing end through the back of the hook and just trim off the extra bit of the tag end. Then it's just about doing a knotless knot to secure that tag end to the shank just wind the line around the tag end and the shank at least seven times. Then thread it through the front of the eyelet. Then just use your preferred knot to attach the standing end to the swivel. A Palomar knot is easy and strong if you want to just go with that. Thread the main line through the method lid and attach that line to the barrel swivel. Now you don't have to, but if you do end up using a method lead, it's important that your swivel fits in that nook of the method lead head there and has a somewhat tight fit. It's that friction or resistance that helps the hook set when a fish strikes and starts to meander off with the bait. Now it's just about using a threading needle to put on the best, thickest pieces of sweet corn out of your batch. I don't even bother using a bait stop um, as it really won't help if using corn. The two knots we tied in the hair rig will keep on 
the important pieces of corn. Alternatively, if you don't have a method lead, you can use a tri-swivel and attach a weight to the bottom, or you can rig something up like a Carolina rig with an egg sinker. You could also attach a split shot to prevent that sinker from moving. Not necessary, but it'll add some resistance for the hook set. Either way, no matter how you want to tie it, you want your presentation on the bottom for these bed thick feeders. On this day, to further test the technique, I have brought Ace with me to the river so we can have him knock some buffalo suckers off of his life list. And so we're using the raw mixture of what my boily recipe is for, common carp on the method leads, except in this recipe I switched out koi pond food for dog food, and I'll link that recipe video in the website page down in the video's description. I'm chumming the water with both corn as well as dog food. Yeah. Every time I've come out and done this, you know, they don't come up to the chum spots for about two hours gotta wait but then they just start hitting so and keep chumming after you uh, after a couple hours keep that spot fresh and scented but if you chum they will come fish on fish on go get it hey, let me grab that off make an ace use a, a lefty my, my Corrado. Ooh. Keep it on top. Nice. Look at that. Nice fish. Okay, so you want to back up and get me in focus. So Ace's specimen on this day and all the specimens I've pulled all appear to be introgress specimens or specimens that experience gene flow between species. So let's get into that frustration of ideeing within this genus of ichthyobus. So, like I said, the three species of ichthyobus suckers that we have in the United States are big mouth, small mouth, and black buffaloes. There are two other species with small ranges down in Mexico and Central America. Telling the big mouth sucker apart from the small mouth and black is fairly simple just by analyzing the position of the eye versus the mouth. On the big mouth, the mouth is more terminal or facing forwards, and the top of the interior part of the lip there will almost be in line with the bottom level of the eye while on the smallmouth and black buffaloes, that lip is clearly sitting below the bottom edge of the eye with a mouth that is subterminal or facing more downwards. Big mouth will also have much thinner lips than what you are seeing here. As far as identification between black and smallmouth buffaloes, it's not always a simple task. In fact, it can just be impractical in many situations. And far be it from me to say I'm an authority on identification within this genus, but I can tell you exactly why it's such a pain in the ass. <gasps> so after sifting through a number of studies and guides, I finally found a thorough publication by Bart et al. on why identification in this genus is so tricky. And they did a bunch of genetic and morphometric analyses of specimens all throughout the ranges. The first important thing for you to know is that the smallmouth, black, and even big mouth buffalo can all hybridize. So there is most likely a long history of introgression and gene flow within this genus. So basically there are just a hell of a lot of specimens with shared genetic code. The publication did suggest that among the five species within this genus, for the most part they can be distinguished from one another based off of morphological or physical features, except the black buffalo which has a lot of overlap of physical features with some other species in this genus, especially the smallmouth buffalo. In fact, there is one sentence from this study which pretty much sums up how impractical it is to ID within this genus. Only Ichthyobus labiosus, which is confined to upland portions of the Rio Panuco on the eastern edge of the Mexican plateau, is distinct both morphometrically and genetically. So, 
only one species is distinct both morphometrically and genetically. So that's essentially saying if you took some random genetic sample from some specimen within this genus, there is so much shared genetic code that even a DNA test might not be able to confidently identify what species that is. Furthermore, the populations that recently colonized uh, areas in the Great Lakes Basin and the Gulf Coastal Rivers from both west and east of the Mississippi River were definitely populated with already introgressed specimens. And I know one of our anglers here, Dan V, had a hard time IDing his nice catches from southern Ontario. And it makes sense because all the populations up in the Great Lakes Basin sprouted from genetically admixed stock. Nice fish though, and I think the community consensus is that this one definitely leans towards black buffalo. But even with all that genetic ambiguity, Bart et al. have recommended that, at least for now, the species within Ichthyobus remain distinct species because there's sufficient enough differences between four of the five species. While again, that black buffalo just has too much overlap with a couple of other species within the genus. So even though there's a lot of overlap between the genetics and the physical features, there are some things that we can look at on the black and smallmouth to kind of help us say, okay, yeah, that definitely looks like one or the other. We're just gonna look at some adult specimens of black and smallmouth that sit on the non-overlapping spectrum of morphological features. And fisheries research scientist Brandon Brook was kind enough to let us use his specimen photos of what we can surely call a black buffalo. For comparison, we'll use some U.S. Fish and Wildlife photos of smallmouth buffalo, as well as a decent specimen of a smallmouth buffalo I found on the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks publication, which should be public domain. Although, as I browsed this government publication, I found an error. That is not a green sunfish like they suggest it is. That is a hybrid, a green gill. So, lesson being for all of us, especially with these buffalo suckers where there's so much overlap, of genetics and uh, morphology, even official publications make mistakes, so we just have to be aware of that. The body of a smallmouth will typically have more of a football shape, while a black has more of an elongated bullet shape, and we really see how much deeper that body is on the smallmouth, while the black is much more elongated. The smallmouth looks much more like a hunchback, partly due to having a more prominent keel or a sort of pointy ridge that's obvious on the nape. On the black buffalo, this keel may exist, like it does here, but it's typically less, to where it's more of a smoother, roundly transition on the nape. From the lateral view, you can notice that keel more by looking at the base of the dorsal fin. On the smallmouth here, the scales on that ridge kind of just ride upwards into the fin, while on the black, those scales are flatter. And that body shape can sort of be analyzed with a simple comparison of how many times the body depth fits into the standard length. This isn't a fast and hard rule at all for distinguishing them, but usually the black buffalo will have a body depth that fits into the standard length 2.6 to 3.2 times according to Hubs and Logler's ID guide. So that standard length is taken as a straight line from the most anterior part of the fish all the way to the hyperal crease or hyperal plate. And sometimes it'll go right to where the caudal rays start. It's essentially the same area, and I'm not sure the method they use to get that uh, standardization. Body depth is always taken from the deepest part of the fish's body, and fins don't count for this measurement. So the smallmouth buffalo typically has a deeper body where that body depth fits into the standard length 2.2 to 2.8. Uh, some sources say 2.9 times. So really, if the body depth fits into the standard length three times or more, it's expressing more of a black buffalo length. And if it's 2.5 times or less, it's expressing more of a smallmouth buffalo length. Black buffalo typically have thicker bodies and larger, more conical heads, but no guide or study I found listed the actual morphometrics on this. So I just did my own morphometric analysis on 20 adult specimens just to give us a rough idea. Nothing fast and hard as a rule here, but it seems most black buffalo will have a head length fitting into the standard length less than four times, while most smallmouth have a head length into the standard length more than four times, while plenty of overlap still exists for this feature. 
odds are you're going to pull up an introgress specimen no matter what. I mean, there's going to be shared genetic code in your fish. But that doesn't mean all of them are going to appear introgressed. You're going to get some strong smallmouth looking ones and some strong black looking ones. And then you're going to get the ones that just be head scratchers. Like the ones Ace and I pulled up today. So to decide on a species and cross a specimen like this off of your life list, it's really about deciding if you think your fish is showing more black buffalo features or more smallmouth buffalo features. And for Ace's fish, it really does have an elongated body. The body depth is just under three times the standard length, and that's more of a black feature. But because the keel is so pronounced and the overall shape, I think, leans a bit more towards smallmouth, we'll just say Ace knocked a smallmouth buffalo off of his life list today. And if you have some great fishing tips for buffalo suckers, we'd love to read them in the comments down below on this video. All right, I hope you get out there and catch some big suckers as far as the identification goes. Uh, we've gone over why that's going to be so tricky. Let's just hope that Bart and his crew are still working on this. And maybe one day we'll have a more reliable uh, morphology guide to kind of guide us on how to ID these. Fish responsibly and good luck. Coming up on KNFS, I chase stripers in Massachusetts where one gives me the best fight I've had all year. And then I'm off to New Jersey, micro fishing for young pickerel for the guide, but getting much more than I expected. Oh, holy 